interesting to see the headlines of today's papers through a different lens, and that is through the sovereignty as presented. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, we'll be looking at chapter 8. If you want to open your scriptures to that place, also if you like to fill in blanks, we have a couple of blanks awaiting your pencil. You'll find an outline in your weekend handout. Let's pray. Get right to work. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to listen. We pray you'd forgive our speaker. His sins are too many to count. Grant that we can see Jesus, just Jesus. And through Jesus, we pray. And all the church said. Well, the book of Daniel reveals a Babylonian survival strategy. Babylon was a hostile to Daniel's faith when he was transported there in 605 BC. It was an actual place for Daniel. It's an actual struggle for Christians. We, like Daniel, find ourselves in an increasingly godless and secular society. And we ask, how can we cultivate a faith in a world that has so little? The story of Daniel answers that question with two words, promise and prophecy. Daniel believed in the promises of God, even though he was tested by kings, and even though at one time he was fed to the lions, he trusted in the promises of God. Remarkably, he also found faith and strength in the prophecies of God. The prophecies in the book of Daniel comprise some 50% of the book. So to study the book of Daniel is to study prophecy. Daniel found strength in these prophecies. You might say that he read the history book before history happened. Prophecy enabled him to trust God who held the future because God had revealed enough of the future to Daniel to give Daniel courage. The first prophecy in Daniel's book is found in Daniel chapter 2. It involved a dream that the king of Babylon had, a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel interpreted the dream. The king saw a statue that was comprised of four metals. Remember this? The four metals represented the four ages and the four stages of the upcoming Gentile history. The ten toes at the base of the statue anticipated a ten-nation confederation. And this confederation will attempt to control the world according to the prophecy, but will fail because it will be struck by an uncut stone. That is a stone not made by human hands. And that stone we came to learn is, is Jesus Christ. Just wanted to see if you're listening. This prophecy reappears in Daniel chapter 7. Last week, we looked at how the same prophecy appeared, this time not in the form of a statue, but in the form of visions. Daniel was the one who saw the visions, and they foretold a timeline and a message that was retold over and over in the book of Daniel. Empires will have their day, but God will hold his sway over human history. And these four nations indeed have come and gone. But the ten-nation confederacy that is anticipated by the ten toes in Daniel 2 and the ten horns in Daniel chapter 7, that's sometime in the future. I can't help but chuckle the thought of somebody listening to a message like this for the first time. Ten toes, ten horns. What in the world is the preacher talking about today? Well, Daniel had questions, too, when he read prophecy. In fact, when we concluded Daniel chapter 7, we were thankful because Daniel was asking questions of the angel. He said, while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. The horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. This puzzled Daniel, so he asked the angel for more explanation, and the angel gave it. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones, and he will subdue three kings. 
He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time, which is three and a half years. So the legacy of this evil king appeared at the end of chapter 10, uh, chapter 7. It is the central theme of chapter 8. In Daniel 8, Daniel focuses on our timeline in this section between the Ten Nation Confederacy and the Tribulation. And what he saw allows us to make a sobering statement. You like to fill in the blanks? Here's one of them. A bad dude is a coming. A bad dude is a coming. Antichrist is the name most commonly used for this scoundrel. He is quite literally anti-Christ. He is anti-hope, anti-health, anti-joy, anti-peace, anti-forgiveness, anti-salvation. Everything that Jesus is for, he is against. He is anti-Christ. Your Bible has about 100 passages that speak about the arise, the, 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 the rising up, the falling down, the doom, the destruction, and the devastation of this final world ruler. God wants us to know something about him. Not enough to be obsessed with him, but enough to be informed about him. And while there are many things we do not know, there is a paragraph in chapter 8 that tells us enough to give us an outline for the life of of the Antichrist. Now, for the sake of time, I've had to leapfrog toward the end of chapter 8. In doing so, we have leapfrogged over two really fascinating uh, prophecies, one about Alexander the Great and the other about an evil ruler that you may have never heard of, Antiochus Epiphanes. Antioch Alexander the Great consumed nations. Antiochus Epiphanes was a foreshadowing of the Antichrist in the sense that he devastated the Jews and he desecrated the temple. But they were choir boys compared to the evil one who is to come. Picking up in verse 23. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king a master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. This paragraph reads like, an, well, like a table of contents to the life of the Antichrist. Take it phrase by phrase. He will appear in the latter part of their reign, there meaning the ten kings. Toward the last days of the ten-nation federation, this evil ruler will arise. He will come when rebels have come, become completely wicked. Something is going to trigger a tsunami of unprecedented evil. And during this time of immorality and dep depravity and barbarism and terrorism, this evil ruler will step forward. Are we in those days yet? No, we're not. And I'm going to tell you when those days are going to happen in just a minute. There's something that's going to trigger this tsunami of evil. He will be a fierce looking king, a master of intrigue. I don't know what that means exactly. He will have an intimidating air about him. Maybe his eyes will be beady. Maybe his jaw will be strong. He will be a master of intrigue. This is an interesting Hebrew phrase. It can mean one of two things or both. It can mean that he is savvy. He has the capacity to be cunning. It can mean that he indwells the world of the occult. Or it can mean both. It probably does. In the book of Revelation, John says the Antichrist will have the mouth of a lion. That is to say, he will command attention when he speaks like the roar of a lion. The Antichrist will mesmerize the world with pompous words. He will seduce with his great oratorical skills. He is hypnotic, will be hypnotic in shrewdness and language. He will even claim to be God. 
And then the vision says he will become very strong, but not by his own power. John's revelation agrees with this. The dragon, in Revelation 13, the dragon gave the beast his power in his throne and his great authority. In other words, the Antichrist is Satan's proxy. What Satan did to Judas on the night of the betrayal, Satan will do to this person. He will indwell him. He will do what the Holy Spirit longs to do with us. He will control him and lead him. The Antichrist will present himself as a great peacemaker. As we unpack chapter 9, which goes further in this prophecy, we will see that leader will make a firm agreement with many people for seven years. He is going to inaugurate a time of peace and he's going to walk onto the world stage like a diplomat. He'll be carrying an olive branch. And he will negotiate a seven-year peace treaty between everyone in the world and Israel and will be celebrated as a great peacemaker, accomplishing what no one else could accomplish. Yet midway through this treaty, he will break it and all hell will break loose. He will cause astounding devastation and succeed in whatever he does. This devastation is the main theme of the book of Revelation, chapters 4 through 19. Chapters 4 through 19 detail the horror of the tribulation with phrases like cosmic disturbances, famine, and death. J. Dwight Pentecost was right when he wrote, no passage can be found to alleviate to any degree whatsoever the severity of this time that shall come upon the earth. The tribulation shall indeed be the darkest time in all of human history. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. People who find faith during the tribulation will be under his persecution. In addition, the Jewish remnant will feel the full force of his anti-Semitic ire. The Antichrist will cause deceit to prosper. He will grow wealth on the back of the poor, and he will develop wealth with seeds of dishonesty. And when they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. He will be destroyed, but not by human power. The great news is he will be destroyed. The bad news is the world has to see him first. Combine the putrid spirits of Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, Idi Amin, with a dozen other arrogant rulers, and you have a glimpse of the Antichrist on his nice day. No wonder Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let those who are in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city, for this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. I know what you're thinking. Max, it's been a long time since you preached such a happy sermon. <laughs> My goodness, I just feel lifted up. I just feel like I could soar out of here on wings. All this encouragement, how you're just building us up today. I'm ready to take on my week. Oh, my goodness, I can't remember such a happy sermon. It's a dark message, isn't it? It's a dark chapter. But listen, I'm not finished yet. And I have some good news for you. And it's just not good news. It is wonderful, life-changing news. It is the kind of news that makes the gospel good news. Yes, a tribulation is coming and no one can imagine how evil it will be. No one can imagine it. Yes, Satan's henchman is coming. And he is terrible beyond words. But here's the point. You will never have to meet him. If you are in Christ, you will never have to meet him. If you want to applaud Jesus. And I want to tell you why. It is true that a bad dude is a coming. But it is equally true that all 
believers will be a leaving. <laughs> this is the next major event from my perspective in biblical history, recorded in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Simply put, Christ is coming for his church. Christ is coming for his church. And upon the signal of Christ, all Christians, whether alive or dead, are going to be transported into the presence of Christ. This event includes the resurrection of dead believers, your loved ones, your friends, the people you miss, people you long to know. This includes the resurrection of all dead believers. It includes the transformation of believers who are living whenever this happens. And yes, it includes children, preborn, newborn, and young. It includes the very children to whom Jesus said, let the children come unto me. He will receive them into his kingdom. This is the transformation that Christ has promised. I believe you can summarize the gospel with seven arrows. The first arrow is the birth of Jesus. He came down to the earth. The second arrow is the life of Jesus. He lived a perfect life on the earth. The next arrow is the death of Jesus. He died a sacrificial death for us, receiving his, our sins upon himself, and he was buried in the tomb. But then he rose from the dead. There's the next arrow. He rose from the dead and is seated right now in the heavens overseeing the affairs of mankind. He sent the Holy Spirit to lead us now in the time of the church to guide us, to, te to, to protect us, and to teach us. And then a time is coming of the tribulation and then there will be a second coming of Christ. This was the first coming. This is the second coming of Christ, and he will establish an earthly kingdom on our planet and restore it to its intended beauty. Now, those of you who are very smart counted how many arrows? Six. Max, you're missing one. Here it is. It's right here, and it is called what? The rapture. Now, the word rapture does not appear in the Bible. The word rapture, however, has come to be known as the word that describes the resurrection of the saints that will take place before the second coming. Really, I think it's best to see the rapture and the second coming all kind of as one event. Christ will come for his church and he will return with his church. He will come for his church before the tribulation. The word rapture is not in the Bible. I can remember as a kid seeing a bumper sticker that said, in case of rapture, this car will have no driver, and asking somebody, what in the world is rapture? Well, it comes from a Latin word, rapturo, and rapturo is the Latin translation of the Greek word that is translated into English, caught up. So we are caught up in the air, and the church fathers translated the Bible into Latin. There appeared that word rapturo, so for many centuries it took on this name rapture. So don't get bothered that the word rapture is not in the Bible. It's just a, biblical, a term that's a non-biblical term, but it's a commonly used phrase to describe the rapture. It simply means to be caught up, to be caught up in the air. Now there's much discussion about when this rapture will happen. I really believe I believe with all my heart that this rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. And I have several reasons. One reason is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the most thorough description of that tribulation. And the book of Revelation dedicates the chapters from 4 to 19 to the description of the tribulation. In those chapters, there is no reference to the church. Before those chapters, chapters 1 through 3, there are 19 references to the church. And it's like all of a sudden when the tribulation starts, the church is absent. Another reason. In Luke 17, Jesus compared the rapture to the days of Lot and the days of Noah. Who remembers the story of Noah and the story of Lot? 
Remember that Noah and Lot were rescued prior to the divine judgment. Noah felt no raindrops. Lot felt no brimstone. In the same manner, I think that Jesus will rescue the church and we will not feel the ire of the Antichrist. Also, he has promised to do this. Jesus is described as the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. Paul clearly stated, God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then also one more reason. After describing this resurrection of the righteous or the rapture, Paul tells us to encourage one another with these words. Now, I would have a hard time encouraging you today if I had to tell you we're all going to go through a seven-year period of horrific suffering. You would not find that very encouraging. But I do find it joyfully easy to say, now be encouraged because Christ is coming before you before that rapture begins. Here's another way to look at it. When a machinist or a mechanic sweeps his shop at the end of the day, he has, as a result of the sweeping, a dustpan full of trash. This trash has paper in it. This trash has wood in it. This trash has receipts in it. This trash has pits of cork in it. This trash has trash in it. But also intermingled in this trash, since it's a machinist shop or a mechanic's shop, are likely lots of what? Nuts and bolts and screws and washers. I know this because my dad was a mechanic. And he never threw away a nut, a bolt, a screw, or a washer. He had this little cabinet with all these tiny drawers. Have you ever seen one of those? And he kept every one because he'd always say, now you never know when you're going to need it. A mechanic at the end of the day, if he wants to keep these, has two choices. He can sort through them with his fingers, and many do, or a clever mechanic will take what? A large magnet and hover it over the trash And everything that shares the property with the magnet will be picked up. This is a picture of the rapture, that Christ will appear in the sky. And every person that shares a property with Christ or the identity of Christ or the essence of Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, the growth of Jesus within us, every one of us will be transported. We will literally fly up. We will be caught up to meet him in the air. His presence will be so magnetic that we will be caught up to meet him in the air. Isn't that going to be an exciting day? It's nothing to be afraid of. It's nothing to be anxious about. In fact, it's going to happen so fast, you're probably not even going to know what is happening. The scripture says it will happen in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. The Greek word for moment is atomos, atomos, from which we get the word atom. To the degree that an atom is small, this moment will be quick. It will happen in the twinkling of an eye. Watch this. My eyes just twinkled. <laughs> See how quick that was? That's how long Jesus needs to rescue his church. Jesus said, I tell you, on that night, two people will be sleeping in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other will be left. A modern translation of this verse might read, two people will be sipping coffee at a Starbucks. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two people will be watching a movie. One will be taken and the other will be left. Now consider the implications of this sudden unprecedented resurrection. God-fearing teachers will vanish from schools. Every faith-based NGO will be vacated. Christian schools will be suddenly empty. Christian teachers will no longer be on the planet Christian politicians, those who take a stand for faith, will be nowhere to be found. Christian doctors, lawyers, researchers, and professors from all over the planet, every language, every culture, will suddenly be gone. The salt and light of society will be withdrawn. 
The Apostle Paul said it this way. The secret power of evil is already working in the world. That's the power of the devil that will be manifest expressly through the Antichrist. That power is already at work in the world. You'd agree with that, right? But there is one who is stopping that power. Would you agree with that? That is the Holy Spirit working through the church. And he will continue to stop it until... He is taken out of the way. In other words, at the rapture, the Holy Spirit will remove his restraining power from our already fragile society and set the stage for the false Messiah to appear. Think about it. What happens when hundreds of millions, maybe billions of tax-paying, God-fearing, family-loving God-seeking people suddenly disappear. Who's going to take up the slack? Who's going to step into the vacuum? Who's going to explain their disappearance with flowery oratory and deceptive promises? Who's going to seek to bring the world together in a sudden false peace treaty and say, peace, peace, where there is no peace? Who is this? It's the Antichrist. The stage will be set for the master of deception to work his evil and with flowing oratory and satanic power rooted in the occult, he will offer easy solutions and make exorbitant promises that he himself will break after a short time. Chuck Swindoll offers this summary paragraph This man will emerge after the rapture, probably to calm the chaotic waters troubled by the unexplained departure of so many Christians. He will be primed and ready to speak. He will stand before not only a nation but a world, and he will win their approval. Like Hitler, he will emerge on a scene of such political and economic chaos that people will see him as a man of vision with pragmatic answers and the power to unite the world. Is the Antichrist alive on our planet today? We do not know. What we do know is that he cannot inaugurate his day of evil until the restraining power of the Holy Spirit has been removed from the earth and until the church has been raptured into the presence of Christ. So even Satan or especially Satan, has to wait on God's clock. He's waiting on God's timing, and Satan does not know when the rapture is going to occur. We do not know when the rapture is going to occur, but we know it will. And there will come a time in which the good shepherd will gather his flock to himself. And once the devil sees that the good shepherd has called home his flock, he will appear at the gate And he will begin to seduce and to wage conflict upon those who have been left behind. When my daughters were small, especially in their elementary school age, they used to love to ride their bikes in the afternoon. They'd come home after school and do their homework. And if there was any time, they would say, we want to go ride bikes. When the days were short in the December, January, and February in the wintertime. I would always have to say, now, you can go ride your bike, but I want you home, what? Before dark. Before dark. And off they would go. And most of the time, they would be back before dark. But every so often, it'd start getting dark and no daughters. And what would I do? I'd step out into the yard and I'd call out their names. Jenna, Andrea, Sarah, time to come home. A loud voice. I didn't have a trumpet or I would have sounded it. But a loud voice. And if they didn't hear my voice, I'd go looking for them. Why? Because that's what a good dad does. He doesn't want his children to face the dark alone your good father loves you so much 
that he will not let you face the coming darkness alone. He loves you so much that he is coming for you. (laughs) And he loves you so much that he's told you he's coming for you. And he has promised that you will hear his voice and you will be caught up like a bolt to a magnet into the presence of the king of kings. And during that time of tribulation, you will enjoy a time of celebration in which you are being prepared as a bride for a groom to return with Christ at the second coming, to reign with him upon this earth. Now it dawns on me that somebody might hear this message and think, Locato, what were you smoking this week when you studied? I've never heard anything so crazy. You expect me to believe that? What a what? You're telling me that every Christian is going to sudden, suddenly vanish from the planet? And this world is going to be left with a consequential and ensuing chaos? And onto the world stage is going to walk this, this false Messiah who's going to promise to solve all the world's problems when in actuality he's really setting up the world for a great sucker punch? You're telling me that the devil is going to indwell someone so evil and so completely that he will run the world for a while and then try to run the world off a cliff and then Christ himself will come and he will rescue God's people and establish his kingdom. It can sound a bit challenging to the imagination. As I imagine the message of Noah sounded before the flood. People had never seen rain before. And yet Noah preached that people should prepare themselves because the rain was about to fall. And so he started building an ark. Don't you know they thought that was the craziest thing they had ever heard? But don't you know the minute that the door to that ark was closed that Noah was suddenly a genius? Jesus said, in the latter days, it shall be as it was in the days of Noah In the days of Lot, people will not listen. They will not pay attention. They will dismiss it. They will be given to the affairs of this world. They will not be paying attention. Now, maybe that's where you've been. And I would suggest to you that if that's where you've been, then God has brought you here to hear a message. Dismiss it at great peril. Dismiss it at great peril but receive it with great hope. You are loved by God. You have been chosen by God to be a part of an eternal kingdom on this earth, and that involves a time of tribulation, and you don't have to be here for it, in which God will purge the earth, and he will begin again. And that's when you are going to be able to worship as you have never done before. May God lead you to that place. Amen. Heavenly Father, now please would you take these words and let them fall deep in our hearts. Do not let the devil, do not let the evil one come as he likes to come and snatch seeds and, 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 and interrupt the development of faith. We, we stand against him. We stand for Christ. We receive now this message and ask that you would do your work within us. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Amen.